Sometimes we look around and we say, oh, poor me. But, Lord God, we are, we are on our feet, able to take in oxygen and able to praise you by the raising of our hands and the opening of our mouths. So, Father, we thank you this day for that opportunity and that ability. 
And as we take up this offering, Lord God, I ask that you'd have your hand upon each one of us, that we give back unto you as you have blessed us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we thank you for that, that ever-cleansing power of your blood, Lord God. We thank you for that, Lord. Now we're going to sing that Rock of Ages. Let's sing that. Rock of Ages, cleanse for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from my wounds and floor be a sin. The double kill. there 
with his crew. I had plumbers there with their crew, crew the electricians there with their crew, the heating and cooling guy there with their crew, and the guy who was supposed to show up, the construction manager for the project, called me 20 minutes before they all showed up and said, hey, guess what? I can't be here. I can't get there. And I said, well, thank you very much, Jerry. I appreciate you calling me. And so I was there all day trying to direct everybody in what I wanted done and, and uh, what the, the information I needed. And, and the, uh, the building inspectors, they were the last ones to leave. And they were going up on the roof. And, and I went up on the roof with them. And I, and I was talking to them up on the roof. It was a nice day I brought in. And uh, we checked out the roof and everything. Everything turned out just fine with uh, the building. And he said to me, you know, that's right. Praise the Lord. I was thankful for that, too. Because I was, you always think there's going to be something, you know. But uh, I was talking to him, and, and he said to me, well, now, what denomination of church is this going to be? And I says, well, it's going to be Pentecostal. Oh, are you Assembly of God? And I said, yes, we are. We're Assembly of God. And, uh, and he said, well, I just uh, got to tell you, I'm a Baptist preacher in Slipia. And I said, well, good deal. We can agree on most things then, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, we can agree on most things. And, and, and I visited back and forth with him. And, and we, talked, we talked about a lot of things. You know, we've, uh, we've had some of their people in our church. And they've had some of ours that, that quite frankly, that I ran out of our church in their church. <laughs> And, and we visited back and forth, and, and as we were doing that last song, Give Me That Old Time Religion, I was just thinking about how churches have changed so dramatically. You know, it, used to be, it used to be church on Sunday morning was the deal. This is what we did. You know, growing up a Catholic, whether it was Sunday morning or Saturday night, we, we never missed. We were there for church. We were, we were there. Nothing stopped us. I don't care if you, you had to be almost dead before you didn't go to church, you know, for Sunday morning or, uh, or Saturday night. And, um, and church, was, church was always something. You know, I, and i got to tell you, I, I, I hated going to church. And in the church in Lake Benton, in that Catholic church, it was an old church and had a slanted floor like this. Did I ever tell you about tell you that story? The mm -hmm. slanted, little slanted floor like this, and it was a wooden floor. And and I and again, I, did I tell you already I hated church? Yeah, I think I did. I did. I hated church. I just hated going. For whatever reason, I just hated going. And and uh, one Sunday, um, now mind you, there was nine of us, and, and the old man would always sit right in the middle of us. Mother would sit right here. He would sit right here because I swear his arms would be at a stretch all the way down to the end of that pew. And I always tried to get down to the very end. I wanted to be there so I could kind of duck a little bit, you know. And we always got there. We were one of the first ones there. It wasn't because we were holy, mind you. It wasn't because we were interested in being there. It was because we wanted to be the first ones to get the heck out of there when the service was over. And we filled the whole pew back there. I remember one time. I remember one time, Joe, even they used to have these little box of jaw breakers. Just a little box like this. And I snuck a box of jaw breakers in there one time. And my brother Joe was sitting right beside me right here. And uh and uh <laughs> and I was all looking for jaw breakers. He said, Give me one. I said, No, you're my own. He said, Give me one. I said, No, and he jams me. And the jawbreakers hit the floor. <laughs> and the jawbreakers were rolling under the pews all the way to the front. I could hear them bouncing off of people's feet, going all the way to the front and hitting the wooden altar in the front. And and then and then and then the old man he just he looks at me and it's just like you're you're dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember I remember it so well because it wasn't that didn't end it. It, it was so it was it was quite a day that I'll never forget. Because I remember going up for communion that day. And I'm up there, and I don't even remember what we had to say anymore. But I got up there, and I see all them jawbreakers. And they, and the first thing I think about, we're getting in before I go. There's all them jawbreakers, and a friend of mine, his name is Steve. And Steve got saved not too, about 10 years ago, and I seen him in Sioux Falls not too long ago. But uh, Steve was uh, sitting right there halfway back, and, and walking back, I looked at Steve, and he looked at me, and he made this funny face. And I just started laughing. Back. And I knew I was already in trouble, so it didn't matter. You know? But after that service, my dad, who was now you know, close to 90, was, you know, for, was a giant of a man to me. And after the service, when it was all over, outside somewhere, he 
pinned me up against the wall with my collar like this, and he said to me something I never forgot. He said, church is no place to have fun. It was there and then that I decided when I get out of this household, I will never darken the door. But God in his infinite wisdom and mercy has now called me to be a preacher for the last 30 some years. I mean, how strange is that? And it's fun. And one thing that I like to do, one thing I want to make sure that we do, I want to make sure people have fun in church. But I want them also to know that, hey, this is serious. I want them to know that this is the most, as I see it, I don't know how you all see it, but as I see it, this is the most important hour of your week. Amen. Amen. That's how I see it. And, and, and after I got out of church, it wasn't long after that, uh, maybe uh, five, six, seven years, I got saved. That's Jesus in my heart. Changed everything. And, and I said all that to say that, give me that old-time religion. I want that old-time religion that they had in Azusa Street in the early 1900s. And I don't know if you all heard about that, but in Azusa is an actual street in Los Angeles, California. It's the it's the street that is has everything from A to Z. That's why it's called Azusa Street. And it was a block off of Azusa Street that several men and their wives got together and they started to pray that the Spirit of God would come upon people and that there would be a revival. It wasn't long after that. There was a revival in Southern California in a place called Azusa. People were being walked into the stage and they were being slain in the Spirit. As the preachers were preaching, people were getting saved immediately. They were saving them and baptizing them all in the same day. I mean, that's just scriptural. It is said that in Azusa Street that went on for weeks that there were people five, mind you, five blocks away that were walking by minding their own business and they would fall down on their faces before God and repent of their sins because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Old-time religion. And you can, you can bet that they would... They would say to you if they could tell you now, and they will tell you when they get to glory, they would say, it was just fun. It was just fun. It was a time of, of grace and mercy. It was a time of, of seeking God's face and Him reaching down and touching our hearts. It was an amazing time. Jesus saved Peter. He saved Peter on that boat. Just out, just launch out a little bit, Peter, and I want to preach for a while. Okay, well, I'll do that. And then when he's done preaching, Jesus says, and remind you this, that Jesus always pays for what he takes. He says, launch out a little bit further into the deep, and I will give you a catch like you've never had before. And Peter says, well, Lord, we've we, we fished all night. I'm a seasoned fisherman. We've fished all night. We've cleaned our nets. I don't want to do this. He said, launch out in the deep. So he says this famous word that is like in the Bible four times or three times. He says, never the less. Remember that word. Never the less. He launches out into the deep. And Jesus said, throw the net out to that side. And they throw the net out to the side that Jesus tells them to throw it out to. And they pull in a catch so big that their boats began to sink. Well, this didn't happen just once. This happened twice. And Peter comes up to shore and falls before God. And says, I will And then it is in the book of Acts, when they are in the upper room, in the second chapter of Acts, they're in the upper room. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one place in one accord. They were praying up there for the promise of the Father. And it came in as a rushing mighty wind, and it shook the place where they were sitting. And the whole house was filled with this wind that came from the Holy Spirit. And it looked like cloven tongues of fire sitting upon each one of them. And they all began to speak in other languages. Transformation. 
And so, therefore, one chapter later, here is Peter standing up with the eleven, standing up in front of the Pharisees, the high priests, and the very people that want them dead, the very people that crucified Christ, here is Peter standing up and saying, I am testifying to you today that I have seen the one that you crucified, the one that you murdered. I have seen him standing before us and I saw him go up unto the Father. And Peter says, and one man in the crowd hollers out and says, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent. And there was a revival of says that how many thousand got saved? Three thousand people came to Christ. Three thousand people came to Christ because of the event which started by throwing the net over the edge. Remember that word? What was that word? Nevertheless. Because God never does less. He always says more. Always does more. You have your Bibles, would you open up to the book of John, please? John chapter 8. And when you're there, say I'm there, because I want you to follow along if you will. John chapter 8, verse 2, and it reads. Starting at verse 2, and it reads like this. But before we read it, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that you would open our eyes, soften our hearts, that we would hear what you have for us today. And I thank you, Lord, for this marvelous day you blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, early... In the morning, he came into the temple, being Jesus. And all the people came to him and sat down around, and he taught them. Can you imagine what it must have been like sitting at Jesus' feet, being taught by the very Word of God? I mean, what awesome, is it? You know, we can't even, we, you know, that word doesn't even fit, but that's the only one we've got, isn't it? Unbelievable. Just, just awesome. I love that word, awesome. And it doesn't even fit. No. He says, and here he was teaching them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees. And then they're always trying to mess something up, these guys. You know? They're always trying to mess something up. You know, anytime, any listen, listen up, listen up, church. Anytime there's something good happening in your life, the enemy is going to cry try and come in and mess it up. And I call them Pharisees and scribes. That's what I call them. I call them Pharisees and scribes. And here it is. Here it is. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Mm -hmm. Now, now I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this, that, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in those books, they are still under the law of Moses. Okay? They're still under the law of Moses because Jesus hasn't made the sacrifice yet. So they're still under the law of Moses, and that's what the law says. The law says in the commandments, if that happens, you should stone this woman to death. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act, and now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Here they are trying to trick Jesus. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear now that's an amazing thing in itself, isn't it, church? Here they are. The floor is dirt. You know, they have concrete floors or tile floors or carpeted floors. Here he is. He, he, he kneels down. And here he is. 
writing something on the ground, acting like he never heard a word they said. It goes on. It says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is what without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it, being convinced by their conscience, or being convicted by their conscience, went one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with this woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman there. And he said to her, he said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one left here, no one here to condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. He said, go and sin no
anything that pulls us away from the righteousness of God, Paul says in Corinthians, bring that thought right to God. Bring that thought right to God. Oh, I hate that. But I'm bringing that thought right to God. God, forgive me of that thought. Cleanse me of that thought. Cleanse me of that way of thinking. Cleanse me of that way of speaking. Cleanse me of these things. And he does. And here is this woman. Here is this woman. Caught in the very act. Caught in the very act. She, I can only picture this, this gal on her knees with her head down like this. And Jesus, in his great wisdom, is on the ground knowing, because he's omniscient, he knows everything, knowing nothing's going to happen to her except she's going to get saved. Knowing that what's going to take place, and she, he's down there writing on the ground. You know, some some uh, some of the Bible scholars would like to say, well, they think he was writing out the sins of all these guys. Well, I, I, I it doesn't matter. But here's what matters. Here's this lady on her knees before God, and then all of a sudden.
that have never sinned, throw it out right now. As hard as you can. <laughs> Stand up and throw it as hard as you can. They all. The key is this, now, church. You don't want to let your rocks go because you're not done with them yet. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. As those men rock those rocks, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Give us our sins. That's what? Let me ask you just a question. said about me that were just absolute lies and I would hold on to it and it became like a kid as well. And finally when I said years and years ago learned this principle, I just forgive them. Because listen, 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 there is nothing that we could do to somebody on this planet that will be worse for them if they don't accept Jesus Christ before they breathe their last breath. But yet, the Bible tells us in Romans, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels. We hold this treasure in earthen vessels that the world might see what the hope is that lies within us. But when we hold on to the rocks, it's hard to open that vessel. It's hard to open that treasure. Let that treasure come out because what happens is people see stones instead of grace. What's more, what we have to do is be a great way to seal this. I know now what God is doing. So, I, I, I now know because we can't further our lives. We can't further our marriages. We can't further our jobs. We can't further our ministries in all of those areas holding bitterness and unforgiveness within our heart. Because the Word says this. The Word says, if you will not forgive those who have sinned against you, God will not forgive you. That's what it says. Not my, not my words. God's words. Give me a short story. True story. We started the church at Lake Bell. We met the funeral home, half the size of this room right here. We moved back to Lake Benton, Minnesota. We re resigned our church in Nebraska, and we came back to Lake Benton. I was just going to travel and, and sing and, and do some painting on the side. That's all I was going to do. And we, Angie said, well, let's start a Bible study in our house. And I said, well, uh, all right. And we did. And pretty soon, the house was full of people. And one guy was walking out, and he looked at his watch, and as he was walking out, he said, Well, Pastor, when's the church going to start? I said, You go. We're not starting no church. I'm not starting no church. I'm done doing that. I'm not doing it anymore. Well, long story short, we were meeting at a funeral home about the size, half the size of this, and the place was standing room only. They were standing. I was preaching right here, and there was people all around standing up in the back. They were everywhere. Well, then we knew that this is what God wanted. It was one Sunday. It was one Sunday where I'd come in in the back, because I never wanted anybody to see me coming in the front door of a funeral home to have church. It just bothered me somehow. So I always came in the back door. You know, they had a thing that they were saying in Lake Benton, which, in which they always got some wind tunnel somewhere, you know. And in Lake Benton, they were saying, yeah, that carpenter, he's in there raising the people from the dead in there. <laughs> and we were. We were. One Sunday morning, there was a guy sitting in the back row. And I walked in, and I... And my Bible, and I seen him immediately. The place was full, and I seen him immediately. His name was John. John was in high school with me. John and I were at each other's face every day. Nine times out of ten, he won. 
Here he is, he's just gotten out of prison. He's sitting back there. Look at him. God comes home. That Sunday, I'm preaching on forgiveness. That Sunday, I'm preaching on forgiveness. That Sunday, he's sitting right back there, and I still hate him. <laughs> and God comes over me halfway through the opening prayer. And I said, please open your Bibles to this. And he didn't have a Bible. My daughter was sitting here. I grabbed Brittany's Bible. And I said, Brittany, I'm taking this. I'm taking it back there. And I open it up to him. And I give it to him. And I said, here, John, this is where you start. And I still hate I still didn't like it. Come to the altar service. The altar service. Who wants Jesus? John comes trotting up the aisle and falls in Sunday, raising his hands with God, or with the rest of the people, of God's people, praising him. I don't know what John is today. He moved on. But it was in the service church. That service was not for John. It was for me. It was for me. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, God is even now waiting for you to say, are you done with it? Because thankfully he is long-suffering that none should perish, but that all should repent. And giving forgiveness is that very thing. This morning, if you need to get rid of some sin, if you need to get rid of unforgiveness, when it hits that can, it needs to make a noise. And I think it needs to make a noise because Satan needs to know that you mean business. So it's up to you. And then we're going to have to win. If you want to get rid of something, come right up here and drop it in there and grab your chairs again.
Apostle Paul writes this in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says, Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, meaning for what all he has done. And for this reason, this is really important, for this reason, this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. He's talking about the church. Many are weak in the faith, many are sick, not physically, but spiritually. Because we don't examine ourselves. And when we don't examine ourselves, we become just like those that we examine. You ever, you ever heard that, that old saying, you know, you know, this was a sermon that, you know, and maybe you said it even today, this is the sermon that Frank needed to hear. Did uh, you say that to yourself? Did you ever say to yourself, you know, I'm not as I'm not as I'm I'm not as good as, as Joe, but I'm not as bad as Harry. <laughs> Then, when you examine yourself, then eat and drink of that cup. So take a moment to do that very thing. Examine your own heart to be sure that you are in the faith. Father, we just come before you this day. And we thank you for all that you have done. All that you did upon the cross. And we break this bread this day. And as we take it, Father, we know that you are still teaching us to walk in your light. To walk in your way. In Jesus' name, Amen. Yes, thank you.